cancer is a progression. It's not like you just get cancer one day. It's all of these, these particular choices sometimes that we have as human beings, sometimes within our own control, sometimes not. Um, but they, over time, they can translate to uh, increased cancer rates. And a lot of it is metabolic, um, as we see, you know, in the context of liver cancer again, like if you consume a lot of alcohol, if you eat a lot of um, fatty foods, they change the way that the liver metabolizes anything. They change the insulin glucagon ratio, all those sorts of things, which, you know, play this role in creating balance between how all of our organs kind of function together to maintain this, this state of homeostasis or balance in a, in a human being. Um, and we typically develop cancer um, when this, this balance is kind of offset. Um, and eventually over time, you know, when, when these people get cancer, that balance is, is messed up. Mm. And you know, you mentioned alcohol and cancer, and that that's a known risk. Yeah. And is there a certain amount of alcohol that would be advisable <laughs> versus not drinking at all? Yeah, absolutely. And I think this is true with with any carcinogen, because um, you know, alcohol is a carcinogen. Um, there are standards, and I've done a post on this. I can't give you the exact numbers right now, but I've done a post on this explaining, like, you know, dietary guidelines. Um, a drink a week isn't gonna 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 you know, kill somebody or right. make them get cancer. Like I said, it's a progression. Um, but if you're, you know, drinking frequently, um, you know, if you're having a few beers a day, five times a week, four times a week, you're going to experience some issues over time. Mm -hmm. Um, cause your body, you know, we have these ingrained mechanisms to deal with these, you know, stresses. I've studied stress responses for a while. Um, we have ingrained mechanisms to deal with these, you know, our consumption of various foods, whether they're healthy for us or not. Um, but over time, if we continue to consume uh, things like alcohol or, you know, a non-balanced diet, maybe low in protein, those sorts of things, mm -hmm. over time we'll develop not only cancer, um, but obesity, which can eventually lead to things like cancers. Yeah, I think that that's a really important perspective that it's it's interesting how we normalize. Alcohol is very normalized. Yeah. And it's a normalized carcinogen, whereas, say, smoking is not. No one is like, yeah, you know, smoking is, no one's arguing, you know, you can have a cigarette a day and that's good for you. But you might hear people say, well, no, you should, uh, a glass of wine a day is okay. And, um, you know, perhaps that's good for you when actually, yeah, um, maybe it's not. Yeah, no. And that's a really good point too, because I was actually in Mexico for my honeymoon somewhat recently. Really? And, when did uh, you get married? August uh, 28th. Congratulations. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. But outside of that, I was in Mexico. And I saw in Mexico, they actually have the warnings on the, on the alcohol, you know, say this might cause like bold labeling in the airport, mm. uh, saying this may cause cancer. And I literally told my wife, I was like, that's good. That's a good thing. They're telling people this because, you know, you go to the U S like here, we don't, we don't see that. And right. it's like you said, it's normalized. So I think that we should kind of normalize, um, you know, this kind of label associated with carcinogens in our environment. Yeah. You just reminded me of something sure. um, because you talked about the labeling and I, I'm going to read this. So there's this Proposition 65 mm. in L.A. or in L.A. Listen to me in California. Sorry, my uh, L.A. friends. But in California, I think I probably first saw this in L.A. But the labeling is really interesting. Like you had mentioned that something was la actually labeled as a carcinogen. And the cancer space is, you know, you have the cancer biologists and then you have the oncologists and there's so much, the, the, the field is so rapidly, um, I don't want to say advancing, but there's so much research being done. And mm -hmm. then it often takes a lot of time for information to get to the public. And there's this goal to create policy to actually impact change. And, and really, policy often is not necessarily thought of as an individual level. It's really these generalized recommendations. Right. And this was one of these generalized recommendations was this Proposition 65. And it said, uh, if if anyone goes to California, they may see a warning, uh, a warning that coffee, have you seen this? You've seen it, right? I've seen it, okay. yeah. I'm just going to read this. Coffee is a beverage that contains a mixture of many chemicals. Some chemicals are present in unroasted coffee beans and some, like acrylamide, form during the roasting or brewing. Some of these include acrylamide cause cancer. Uh, others, including antioxidants and dietary fiber, might, may protect against cancer. Um, so, yeah, it just goes on to talk about the potential warnings required and uh, about cancer. And it says because it has acrylamide in it. 
Yeah, I mean, I think some labels existed to more so protect the the coffee brewer company from a, a business perspective, mm -hmm. and not necessarily because it's like super realistic advice. Realistically, the levels, assuming that the coffee brewing company is doing justice and and putting out a mm -hmm. safe product, uh, there shouldn't be. <laughs> significant amounts of acrylamide like i work with acrylamide regularly in terms of like making protein gels sds page gels for those of you nerds out there <laughs> including yourself no no definitely um, hard pass on that one <laughs> yeah no we work with acrylamide regularly but we have to be very careful especially when it's um you know in powder form it's probably not in powder form when you're working with it as a powdered form it's it's carcinogenic but when it's you know as a uh, cross-linked to something else or chemically conjugated to something else or in very very low amounts the dose makes the poison. You've heard that time and time again. I, I, I wager that it's very, very low in regarding parts per million uh, where it's not going to harm somebody unless you're consuming gallons of coffee a day, which then you have other issues. Right. Yeah. yeah. Let and alone caffeine addiction. <laughs> <laughs> right. And no sleep. Yeah. Christ. <laughs> when, when I think about things like that, it, it often translates over to, okay, so what are the other things, the other chemicals in foods or put on foods like pesticides and um, uh, fruits and vegetables. There was this whole big thing on the Dirty Dozen, which have you seen the Dirty Dozen? A little bit, yeah. Okay, so the Dirty Dozen is like the, the list of uh, produce or, you know, fruits and vegetables that potentially have higher amounts of pesticides. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure actually, quite frankly, how accurate that is. And if we can really translate, does do these pesticides in the amounts that we're getting do they cause cancer? What do we know about these kind of environmental components? Yeah, so an example of one that I've talked about on my own Instagram is, is glyphosate. Um, and in general, um, it's an herbicide. You know, people use it um, to protect plants. Um, but when those crops are processed to be sold to a consumer, uh, the amount of glyphosate, again, in parts per million that's making it to the consumer is so low that you'd have to consume a literal shit ton of, of veggies to where it would actually harm you. The only people I'd be worried about in terms of handling pesticides and herbicides are the actual farm workers. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, there, there's still safe um, safeguards we can put in place to protect farm workers now that we know more about these carcinogens, you know, the levels of, of interactions and how they relate to specific cancer types. Um, but regarding consumption of vegetables that, you know, are, you know, potentially have a little bit of herbicide or pesticide on them, which is negligible at best. Um, I think people are, are afraid for kind of no reason. Mm. And a lot of that stems from people online with big mouths um, who assume they're correct about things, but they aren't. But and I, it makes people scared. It makes within people reason. scared. It makes people scared within reason. And, and I think that there's, um, I think it makes logical sense to think, okay, Absolutely. so if we are eating uh, fruits and vegetables that are sprayed, potentially that's not a good thing. Yeah. But again, um, how much of it that we're getting, and again, I don't know these answers, but I, I think that when we start talking about organic versus not organic, and then the next level is what if someone can't afford organic, mm -hmm. and we know that fruits and vegetables are important and dietary fiber is important, what is kind of the message that we end up sending people? It makes people very afraid in, in an environment to function. Yeah. And um, I think that that's a, a real negative. So how do you think we combat the fear associated with people consuming food? Because this is, I'm not like a nutritionist, yeah. so I don't necessarily know. Um, and it's something that I see regularly following Lane Norton and things like that. Yeah, and even food Lane. science, babe, which yeah. is awesome. Um, and uh, one of my friends who's a nutritionist, uh, her... Her Instagram handle is Cancer Nutrition HQ. It's yeah. uh, Dr. Crystal Zuniga. I don't know if you've spoken to her, yeah. but we try and you she know, agreed. Talk... She's going to come on. Yeah, We're great. Talk about she, she's going to be awesome. Cancer and sarcopenia, cachexia. Yeah, amazing. Yeah, and yeah, I've collaborated with her in the past. She's awesome. But um, you know, uh, going back to my question, how do we? How do you think we resolve these these issues? <laughs>